I'm privileged to introduce Gino Fernandez from Zurich. Gino is an expert in risk, something we all like to think we take, but most of us actually don't take that many risks in life. But it's interesting to note that if you want to make returns, you have to take risks. So how do we do it in a smart way? And this is certainly something that the field of insurance uh, has to deal with on a regular basis. With that, Gino Fernandez. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. You said the field of insurance does it in a smart way. Unfortunately, we're one of the few industries that over the last 100 years has not returned its cost of capital. So um, maybe I don't have as much authority to speak to you about risk and returns. Um, one thing I did learn from the last panel, though, is that um, my talk, which is 15 minutes long, is exactly five minutes too long to keep all of your attention. So I'm already started off in a, in a bad way, right? So I'll try to condense it a little bit. One of the things I, from this morning and this early afternoon's panel that, that I took away from the discussion of change at scale and the learning that needs to happen in organizations is that change at scale, um, driven by innovation, requires companies to understand and protect themselves from risk. And so given that we just had Memorial Day, I thought I'd start us off by looking at three beaches. I, my, my wife and I like to go to the beach. Our family likes to go to the beach. So I'm going to frame my talk about risk in the world by looking at three specific beaches. I happen to know that there's a pretty nice beach not too far away from here. I live a couple blocks away from campus since summer has officially started. Let's actually talk about Miami Beach. And since I am an insurance guy, I can't go three minutes into a, a talk without mentioning hurricanes. So Miami Beach, it's an excellent example of a phenomenon that I think all of us we've sort of referred to, uh, the gift of failure and other things that we've talked about. The world is getting riskier. Um, in 1926, the Great Miami Hurricane, which was a Category 4 hurricane, left the Miami waterfront flooded under five feet of water. It cost 373 casualties, and it cost, in today's dollars, $1.3 billion of damage. If that same Category 4 hurricane were to hit Miami today, the same force winds uh, today, it would result in thousands and thousands of losses, lost lives and more than $200 billion of damage in today's dollars. It's 200 times riskier to go put up a property in Miami than it was 50 years ago. We are actually actively moving toward risk. All of our companies, all of us, we're actually going toward the places that are um, risky. Despite this, Miami happens to be the fourth largest urbanized area in the United States. And every year, more and more people migrate to Miami to have their summer homes. The concentration of risk in the world is increasing. We go on vacation in Miami occasionally. Um, and one of the things that, um, I'm out of order with my slides. One of the things my family and I like to do when we go on vacation in Miami is uh, rent a big truck, because I don't get to drive a big truck in the city. Uh, and my wife and I rent a big truck, mostly to pile it full of stuff for our kids, beach toys and so forth. The last time, our two-year-old was potty training, so we had to get a portable potty in Miami. At any rate, why am I putting up the big Ford F-150, which, by the way, is the most popular car in America? Um, it's to show you that risks are not only getting more concentrated, they're getting more interconnected. So as innovation becomes interconnected, as education becomes more interconnected, risk is becoming more interconnected. As of 2012, the Ford F-Series pickup truck was America's best-selling pickup truck, and this for the 36th straight year. Also, you'll have to notice that that color, that color is called tuxedo black. Tuxedo black happens to be made with one kind of pigment called xerilic pigment that's produced in one factory in Japan. Now, why am I talking to you about xerilic pigment and the Ford F-150? It's because in March of 2011, there was a great earthquake that happened in Tohoku, Japan, a tsunami that hit the northeast coast of Japan. This was one of the most powerful natural disasters. It closed many, many Japanese assembly plants, and it impacted the whole company's global supply chains. One of the plants that shut down was a Merck chemical plant that was the only producer of the xerilic pigment to make the black tuxedo black Ford F-150. Suppliers had to stop sales in the United States. Um, 
the most popular car, the most popular color, customers were being turned away to the door. Why? Because an earthquake and tsunami hit a manufacturing plant in Japan and it broke the supply chain. They were able to find replacements for some colors, but Tuxedo Black remained off the market until um, its relaunch in 2013. The world is getting riskier, the risks are getting more concentrated, and the concentration of risk is getting much more connected. There are also new kinds of risks. It's not about the same old kinds of risks that um, us insurance people like to talk about, um, earthquakes and floods and so forth, natural catastrophe. There's a whole new species of risk coming up in the world. Um, we all remember the recent um, poor events that are happening at Target. Um, Target recently suffered a pretty major cyber attack that impacted the 2013 holiday season. Um, in this instance, Target didn't react to the malware that actually infected 62,000 of their registers across 1,800 stores in the US until it was just a little bit too late. By the way, it was hard for management even to understand the extent of the breach that uh, caused some of the fire in the insur insuring months. And Target's initial acknowledgement that there was a breach and that credit cards and debit card numbers had been released for over 40 million customers happened to be um, on the lowball. The Secret Service had to come in and tell them that actually hackers gained access to the personal data and account information of more than 70 million people. This is a completely new kind of risk for companies, cyber risk the risk that technologies produce. Um, and as uh, risks emerge, um, you, saw, you saw what happened to Target. The public keeps hearing that Target, um, uh, Target, uh, Target had a breach that had one third of America, 110 million people. A $73 billion retailer, by the way. Target is a $73 billion retailer that cost them more than $2 billion in lost holiday earnings that they had to recover. Companies that are being innovative, that are managing change at scales, need to have the neurotic individuals on their executive teams to ask the questions, what are the concentrations of risks? What are the new and emerging risks? And how connected are those risks? And what do these neurotic people do on executive teams? Well, one of the things they do is they recognize biases. And we've sort of hinted at some of these biases um, as we talked this morning. This is a second beach that I'm putting up. This is Lanakai Beach in Oahu. It happens to be the number one destination for honeymooners in the United States. Now, when people get married, um, when I got married, um, no one thinks about the possibility of getting divorced. I'm not divorced. Um, uh, my wife and I love each other very much. We have, we're not planning to get divorced. She's right over there, yep. But more than 50% of marriages do end in divorce. Not one couple entering into marriage actually thinks of that as a realistic possibility. We all are built, we're psychologically engineered to have optimism bias. When we have a good idea, we attach to it, we stick to it, and we want it to succeed. We have to at least recognize our biases as we create visions for our companies and we execute our strategy. That sometimes the idea needs to be tested by people who are pathologically neurotic on, a, on management teams. And there are uses for those people. They're not the visionary people. They're the ones that will overcome some of our optimism bias. A second bias that I think um, we're psychologically engineered to have um, is um, a confirmation bias. And confirmation bias basically says, um, once I have an idea, I will look for those sources of data that will actively confirm my ideas and discount disproportionately those data that uh, disconfirm my idea. And by the way, this is not malicious. This is simply how we're engineered as human beings. It's a bias that we have to recognize. If I knew what sort of news channel you turned on at night, whether it was CNBC or MSNBC or Fox News, there is a pretty strong um, correlation with what you choose to look at to consume news with all kinds of various beliefs you may have about tax, about the role of government, 
And we can be fairly predictive about those beliefs. In fact, Gallup, Gallup did a poll in 2010 on this very topic about whether, whether the news choices that people choose, whether the ways they consume information have anything to do with their political beliefs. And it turns out that there is a highly partisan selective exposure bias. Now, it's always fun to make fun of politicians and political ideas, but the fact is we all have a confirmation bias when we have strategic ideas in business. And in a world where big data is becoming sort of the buzzword of the day, there's a lot of data, there, you know, we should actually spend a lot of time accumulating this data. It's a very important question that was asked a couple of hours ago. What are the sources of that data? Who compiled it? And who's looking at it? Because those questions actually matter. And unless we recognize that each of us have a confirmation bias when we look at data, it's very easy for us to continue to be diluted. There's a third bias. It's a bias that I like to talk to my actuaries about. That is the plot of the total US highway fatality rates from 1996 to 2000. And the good news is that you can see that the number of fatalities have actually gone down. This is a triumph of seatbelt technology and other sorts of road safety things. So we should all feel happy. We should all feel proud about that. Now, my actuaries can actually draw a very straight line and a very high degree of correlation between the reduction in US highway fatality rates and the number of lemons imported to the United States from Mexico in metric tons. It actually goes back even further than 1996, and there are blips in the highway fatality rate that are also correlated with blips in the export rate of lemons. Now, no one of us will sit and uh, create a model that says that highway fatality rates in the US have anything to do with the number of lemons we consume from Mexico. And yet there is a very strong correlation in the data. No one would say that that is causal. But in a world where we have so much data at our fingertips, these kinds of obnoxious and ridiculous correlations can be easily drawn by the people who are manipulating the data. And they can cause confusion. So at least in our industry, the correlations that exist between different data points serve as a starting point to ask deeper questions about meaning and causation, not as the ending point. And I think that um, I see more and more correlations be brought up as proof points when, in fact, any basic course in statistics would allow us to kind of um, uh, discount those proof points. So it is a bias that we have. We're sort of engineered to look at correlations and say, huh, be convinced by them, um, and then have uh, that serve as evidence. So um, Lanakai Beach, that was Lanakai Beach. <coughs> I've talked so much, uh, a little bit now, about the increasing frequency of risks, the severity of risks. I want to talk a little bit at the end here about how winning companies, innovative companies that execute change at scale, not only recognize some of the biases inherent in management teams, but actually actively manage those biases. And the, the gift of failure that one of the audience participants um, talked about, it, it's a very interesting thing. Um, it's, it's a real privilege to have the gift of failure. I, the first boss I worked for once said, it's OK to fail, like the panelists said, but don't make a habit of it. And I'm sure that, um, that if we ask these great executives to stand up and tell us about their failure stories, they'll do so, right? But there'll be overwhelming counter evidence on that number of times they've been successful. So um, I, I do think that there will be winners and losers in the marketplace um, about who actually innovates intelligently and innovates while managing risk and managing the opportunities for disruption. This is North Avenue Beach here in Chicago. It's a popular destination for the 20-something crowd we were talking um, about to drink their Starbucks um, and other things. Um, North Avenue Beach is on Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan has a serious threat to it right now with the introduction of uh, a foreign species called Asian carp. There's a long name for what the species is. Asian carp are interesting. Um, oops, if, let's not go to iTunes yet. <laughs> Asian carp are interesting things. They can grow up to 110 pounds. They eat up to 40% of their body weight a day. Mature Asian carp can be up to two feet long, 
which give them a pretty significant size advantage over the um, native fish of Lake Michigan. There's a lot of tension. I was with the mayor last week. There's a lot of tension right now um, in making sure that this species is not introduced to the Lake Michigan population because the risk is real, the threat is real, and if they'll get in there, there will be very few native fish in Lake Michigan in the next 10 years. This um, is a story that's been actually repeated in many introductions of um, non-native species into native environments. Um, this one's a little bit close to my heart because I like to fish on Lake Michigan, and I don't want to try to fish for Asian carp. My hooks aren't big enough. It's a disruptive thing. And if the, uh, and it, it, and those who recognize the introduction of disruptive technologies, disruptive ideas, they'll be able to really gain um, uh, an edge in the marketplace. Apple did that, right? We all know the story of Apple. In the 90s, the music industry wasn't expecting um, the innovative and invasive nature of first Napster, which spawned millions of what we used to call ignorant opportunists, the preferred consuming music over only the internet, but for free, right? And the industry was blindsided. It, it was completely disrupted by computer and internet technology. And, and like Asian carp in Lake Michigan, you know, once it's out, there's no putting the genie back in the bottle. Um, the music industry didn't understand the risks when music became broadly available. And companies who understood the paradigm shift, like Apple, were able to apply their know-how, develop new capabilities, and change the business model to one of distribution from content production. Now, there's lots of debates about whether that was a good thing for content or not, but they understood the risk that this disruptive technology posed. They saw it. They questioned their orthodoxies and the biases. Um, they didn't see Napster coming. The music industry didn't. But other, uh, other folks that weren't connected with the music industry at all seized the opportunity and took it. There are examples of all kinds of disruptive technologies that are changing the business models that have long become orthodoxy. This is a screenshot from Zillow. I don't know how many people have looked at things like Zillow and Redfin. There's a way to actually map your house and see the property values of the house. Um, the role of the real estate agent is becoming rapidly, well, let me just say changing. I have several friends who are in the real estate business. And the disintermediation that is happening as a result of the introduction of this disruptive technology is quite frightening. Frightening for those who aren't willing to adapt and aren't willing to look at the opportunities that business models like these create. Winning organizations, I think, um, understand their risks and know where to put their risks. To innovate, you need to take a risk. Our business is about managing risk. Um, we want to manage the risks that um, companies don't want to take of themselves. Those organizations that, um, uh, that will win will be ones that can look at the world differently, that can invest in their people to overcome hidden biases. It'll be those people that, the la as the last panelist said, feed the muscle of learning and innovation, both in management teams and across their entire organizations. Um, and really build a new kind of worker, a knowledge worker, who can take um, the kinds of data that's available, overcome some of the biases that we have, and understand and protect themselves from risk. Insurance co companies aren't really known for their innovative uh, approach to risk. I mean, we're, we, we still talk about the good old days in the coffee houses of London in the 16th century when we got together to underwrite ships going across the Atlantic. And we sort of long for those days. Um, but insurance companies are also at an inflection point, just like all of your companies are at an inflection point. And we have to look at our risks and look at our business model differently. We're investing in predictive analytics and um, we're empowering our decision making by distinguishing good from bad risks, but overcoming the biases that's inherent in a whole profession of people, the actuarial pro profession. Um, we are trying to become more of a learning organization, and we've made a big commitment to do so um, in the US. So anyway, I hope that after this Memorial Day, um, this uh, little trip to the beaches gave you an appetite to spend some time on the sands. I think those companies that are 
uh, are willing to understand and protect themselves from risk. Um, we'd like to welcome you to our beach in Chicago and welcome uh, to sit with us at Zurich as we help you understand and protect yourselves from risk as well. So thanks very much. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Gino. Thank you. So when I asked Will Trumbull at Zurich, I needed somebody to talk about risk. If you're going to have big change, you're going to have big risk. You have a good insurance guy who can talk about risk. He said, yeah, Gino, have you ever heard an insurance guy talk about Asian carp, iTunes, lemons, and auto safety? You got it here. So what I really like about Gino's comments is that he didn't talk about the exogenous risks, mainly like hurricanes. Of course, that came up. He talked about the role we play as business leaders, as human beings, in creating risk and making decisions and the biases we carry with us.